when you're ready, sir. Right, ready. Hi, I'm Tobias Carlyle. This is the Acquirers Podcast. My special guest today is Mark Yusko. He's the founder, managing director, and chief investment officer of Morgan Creek, an asset manager with $2 billion under management. We're going to talk to him about value investing, crypto, the markets, right after this. Tobias Carlyle is the founder and principal of Acquirers Funds. For regulatory reasons, he will not discuss any of the Acquirers Funds on this podcast. All opinions expressed by podcast participants are solely their own and do not reflect the opinions of Acquirers Funds or affiliates. For more information, visit AcquiresFunds.com. Hi, Mark. How are you? Hey, good to be doing great. Uh, thanks for having me on. My absolute pleasure. Thanks so much for giving us the time. Um, I, uh, I've been aware of your presence through Twitter for a long time. Uh, I think I'm simpatico with many of your views, so I'm really looking forward to this discussion. I, I think uh, what I'd really like to know, how, how did you get started? You, you, you went to Notre Dame yep, and then you did your MBA at Chicago. Did you work in between or did you go straight from no, there? No, no. I'm, I'm one of those rare guys, and I don't recommend it actually, that uh, went straight out of undergrad to business school, which really is not the way to do it. Um, but it worked for me. And, you know, the quick background story, I would say my life is just a series of happy accidents. You know, I actually went to Notre Dame to be an architect. You know, I thought I wanted to be Mr. Brady from the Brady Bunch and didn't like it, tried engineering, didn't like that. Uh, then I had a girlfriend, she said, why don't you do what you like to do? Like, oh, that's a novel concept. <laughs> so I tried uh, science, I really loved it, thought I wanted to be a doctor but decided very late uh, not to go to med school. And turns out if you're graduating with a pre-med degree, you decide not to go to med school, there just aren't a lot of jobs. So you can either be a consultant or a pharmaceutical sales rep. And I'm not 6'4 and handsome, so <laughs> pharmaceutical sales rep was out. So I was gonna go to work for this consulting firm and they said, well, you know, you haven't taken any business classes. So why don't you apply to business school? And if you can get into a good one, why don't you go? And uh, the thing about Chicago is they're smart. They know that no one who's ever worked is actually going to go back and do a PhD. So they were trying to get people in a PhD program. So they let people out of undergrad in. Uh, they put you in a class with Gene Fama. And after about three classes, I'm like, oh, there is no way to go into PhD. So, um, <laughs> I, uh, had you, you weren't persuaded to be an efficient markets guy? Uh, not at all. In fact, we'll get to that. That uh, I think the markets are quite inefficient, and I think valuations today are a good example of that. But you know, I had a lot of great classes with a lot of great professors, two Nobel laureates, which is pretty amazing. Um, but I love the experience, and uh, but I didn't know what I wanted to do, and I didn't have any good coaching, and you know, everyone else was getting jobs on Wall Street, and I didn't even really know what that was, and. I got this offer from a, a firm in uh, Chicago that did insurance. My wife had a job as a reinsurance company in Chicago. I said, oh, that's, that's perfect. We'll both be in insurance. And uh, about a uh, year in, the guy who was doing investments retired. And uh, that was my happy accident, number one. And uh, the boss said, hey, why don't you take over? And, and we did fixed income investing. And I like to say I hired Dan Fuss before he was famous famous manager at Loomis Sales. And we'd managed a little bit in-house and we outsourced a little bit. And, and uh, but then I got an exposure to kind of value. I, I went to work for these two guys. They were Northwestern profs and they were the original value investors. I mean, it's actually an amazing thing. You know, Gene Fama gets all the credit with Ken French, you know, for book to market. And the guys I worked for, Bill Breen and Gene Lerner, used to just see, they're like, we invented Price, low price to book investing. <laughs> we were patient zero, right? We were customer number one of CompuStat. And they used to get the tape back when there were no personal computers. Imagine that doing com investing without computers. And they would go to the VAX computer at night at Northwestern and spin this tape and run screens on low price to book. Wow. And it generated thousands of basis points of alpha but they were sending, selling these screens to Merrill Lynch and, and big brokerage firms on the street, making nice money in addition to their uh, salaries from Northwestern. And they had this four-day lead, because back then it was snail mail. So they'd get the tape, 
they'd pick it up in Chicago and it'd go out in the mail to everybody else and they had a four day lead. So um, one of their clients finally said, you know, you'd make a lot more money if you managed money. And so I said, okay, let's do that. So they were the first kind of university professor spin out that formed a firm called Disciplined Investment Advisors, still a great name. And uh, my big thing was we had these coffee mugs uh, that said invest without emotion. I love and it. That was a really big key for me in, in terms of setting up my my life and in investing is this idea that discipline matters, that you got to take the emotion out, that there should be a process and you should have a value bias. And make a long story short, we had we got a billion dollars back when a billion dollars was a lot of money. And um, I got the call. And uh, for those who are college football fans, they'll know this guy, Lou Holtz. He was coach at Minnesota. And he had a lifetime contract unless Notre Dame called. And Notre Dame called. And so he went to Notre Dame, had a great career. We won a national championship. And I would have stayed at Discipline forever, right? We had a billion dollars. There were five of us. Now, they didn't pay the young guys anything, but eventually. And uh, I got the call. I got the call from my alma mater at Notre Dame. They wanted somebody to come back and, and help manage the endowment. And uh, I decided I wanted to do that more than I work in Chicago. And I went back, and it was really a life changer in the sense that. So that's 1993. Yes, that exactly. You, you go to Notre Dame. At, what's the What's the difference between working at Disciplined, where you're, you're that's essentially a value investment, a quantitative yep. value investment yep. firm, but then you yep. go to Notre Dame, and that's you can't run that as an equity only strategy, right? So you had a little bit of a background in bonds. You'd done some equities. Yep. Yep. Now you've got a different model. So what What did you do to to run that? Oh, and it's, look, it's such a great question, and it's and it's really that that transition that was so funny for me at the time because I didn't know what an endowment really was. I, I knew that universities had them, but I didn't really understand what they were. And and the big thing for me was I thought picking stocks and bonds was all there was, right? Because that's all I knew, and I thought quantitative was all there was because that's all I knew. And uh, I remember asking our um, one of our A long short why don't we do a hedge fund strategy you know we we have this model it, it picks the great longs and and uh, on the value side so why don't we just do the inverse and if we pick undervalued companies why don't we short the overvalued companies and he said look it's hard enough to be right once and pay two commissions why would i want to try to be right twice and pay four commissions as that stuck with me uh, even though i'm a big hedge fund guy but um so i realized that i was totally wrong which happens a lot actually just ask my wife um, I was totally wrong that I thought investing was all about picking stocks and bonds. And really, that's the smallest piece of investing. It's only 15% of returns long term. Uh, most of the return, kind of 85% of the return, come from the other three sectors, which are asset allocation. So am I in stocks? Am I in bonds? Am I in commodities? Am I in currencies? Am I in ge you know, geographically diversified? You know, Am I in Japan or the US or Europe or emerging markets? And then there's uh, portfolio manager selection. So which manager am I going to use? Like if I decide I'm going to be in equity and then I decide I'm going to be in value equity, well, which manager would I pick? I mean, there are a lot of good ones, a lot of less good ones. But then even more important that nobody talks about is portfolio construction. Like let's say you run a value shop, I run a value shop. Do we give 50% each or do we give more to Toby because he's a better manager than Mark? Or do we go find a third one and give him a third each? That really matters. And so I, I got this exposure to asset classes being the most important thing. And, you know, perfect example is when I got to Notre Dame, we were, you know, stocks and bonds like everybody else. In fact, the way the endowment was allocated before Scott Malpass got there, but the guy who was my boss, uh, he said that we had a priest and he basically would go to New York and whoever gave them the best dinner and movie tickets uh, or show, <laughs> Broadway tickets, they'd get the biggest allocation. And that was totally logical back then. I mean, it seemed like a good plan because basically endowments were in stocks and bonds. And then this guy, David Swenson and Cambridge Associates in Boston came along uh, with Jack Meyer at Harvard. And kind of between the three of them, they kind of changed the model to say, Let, let's focus on asset allocation. Let's make sure we, we get into the cheapest asset classes. And then let's focus on finding the very best of the very best managers 
And then let's let them pick stock, right? You know, Ford or GM is less important than Tata Motors versus you know U.S. Uh, automakers, but let's let a company decide you know which ones. But back to that point about what I really had the aha moment was, you know, we we go to present. You know, it's 1993. You know, real estate has just gotten crushed um, after the '91 recession. And there was this guy, Barry Sternlicht, you know, billionaire now. But back then, he was not a billionaire. In fact, uh, back then, he was being blamed for being the guy who made the mistake in the spreadsheet that took down, you know, JBL Investments in, in Chicago, or JMB Investments, JMB. And silly, right? But someone had to be blamed, so they might as well blame the young guy. And uh, long story short, he came out and said, you know, as a value guy at heart, there's really deep value out there in real estate today, and nobody wants to talk about it. And that's one of my big takeaways, uh, and I know you've talked a lot about this on the podcast, which is when you feel alone, like desperately all alone in an idea, you're usually right, right? That's usually a really good time to make money. And uh, when you are out amongst the crowd and everybody's having a party and everybody's slapping you on the back, telling you how smart you are, you're probably going to lose a lot of money. So nobody was telling Barry how smart he was in 1993. And uh, we were fortunate enough to, to invest in Starwood and, and things did, did really well. And uh, fast forward a couple years, um, there's just, this firm that- Just, oh, before, you, just before you go, uh, what, what is the, the endowment model? That's the-, the, the sp- yeah. What what is the yeah. insight, the key insight to the endowment model? Is it getting as many different assets, uncorrelated assets, as you possibly can? Is that is that the endowment model, or, or what is it? Well, again, it, really important. It goes a little bit back to Chicago and and Markowitz investment theory. And uh, look, Markowitz is right. I have a shirt that says that. You know, a guy a friend of mine bought it for me. Um, you know, because Harry Markowitz won the Nobel Prize for this construct that when you take uncorrelated assets, is risky. When you put them together, the portfolio is less risky, and it makes no sense when you think about it. How could I take bonds, which are seem to be low risk, and add stocks, which are risky, and the risk goes down? Add hedge funds, risky asset risk goes down. Add venture capital, risk goes down. And so that was the first takeaway, that, that one, Markowitz was right, that diversification works. But to your point or to your question, which, again, is a really insightful question, it's not just maximizing the number of diversifying and uncorrelated assets. It's really about how you move between and among those assets in a disciplined fashion. And so one basic example of that is, is you have to have a strategic investment policy. Right, a policy that drives your long-term asset allocation. Now, people talk about market timing all the time, and they say, oh, it's evil, and you should never do it. No, not, not true at all, right? If you have edge, if you have information edge or analytical edge or process edge, and you have you know, a better set of information and facts than someone else, you should definitely bet away from your strategic policy, and you should bet with the trend, and you should try to capture a bigger portion of those gains to be had as something goes from undervalued back to fairly valued or fairly valued to overvalued because that pendulum is going to swing over time. And so part of the endowment model was having this willing to say, look, market timing in and of itself isn't bad. That's just a movement away from your strategic target. It has to be intentional. And I would say as a good Catholic boy, you know, sins of omission are bad. Sins of commission are forgivable, right? If you don't know you're doing something wrong, that's bad. But if you decide and it turns out bad, that that's okay because you made a decision. And so rebalancing back to your strategic policy is moving back toward that, that target. And so both are a form of market timing. You know, people think rebalancing is good, but think market timing is bad. Well, that's just silly. Right, you're taking profits from one, and you're allocating to cheap assets in another. Like, if you think about, if you got a super cheap asset, and you want to overweight that asset, well, that's market timing. But why is that bad? That's what we should do. We should buy things when they're cheap. And if we have a really overvalued asset, 
and we want to rebalance away from it, that's market timing, but why is that bad? It just makes no sense to me. So, so those are the two elements of the endowment model. So one is, yes, a broad base of, of uncorrelated assets is superior. Two is having a strategic policy and a discipline. But the third, uh, and then there's four points, is the third is a value bias. And look, a value bias, okay, you talked about it and uh, on the podcast with lots of guests, is you know, um, Seth Klarman says it, right? It, it is a little bit genetic, right? You either have it or you don't. And it's not always a good thing, right? There are plenty of times where it can hurt you because you can't participate in a crazy upside move of some crazy growth stock that you just you can't understand the value. Right. Um, so it's not always a good thing. But but there is a value bias into the endowment model. And then the fourth piece of it is uh, a huge bias to the illiquidity premium. So right. having an overweight to private equity, private real estate, private energy, private debt, venture capital, growth equity, things that take advantage of uh, the third risk. I would say there are only four risks that you can take in the whole world, right? If you take no risk, you stay in cash, you get the risk-free rate, hence the name. You can take credit risk, you can buy a bond. You can take equity risk, you can buy a stock. You can take illiquidity risk, you can buy a private asset instead of a public asset. And you can use structure, fancy term for leverage. Those are the only four risks that exist in the world. Now you can combine them in lots of different ways to make lots of different um, investment choices, but those are the only four risks, and you have to take risk in order to make return. And that's and, how the world works. And endowments are uniquely or rarely positioned because they have such a long time frame. So the illiquidity is something that they, that you can factor that into what you're doing, and and, and uh, take advantage of that of that risk. Well, you know what's what's great about that, and what's really kind of funny, many many people have that similar advantage because. You know, if you're in your 20s, your 30s, and you're saving for retirement, investing for retirement, you're gonna you're not gonna touch that money for decades, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80 years in some cases. So you should think like an endowment. In fact, I would say I get in trouble with this, but I say it should be against the law. <laughs> Literally, there should be a law that makes it against the law. Or if you're under 60 years of age, because you can't touch the money. Right. And it makes no sense because every day you're in cash or bonds, you're losing to inflation. Right. So you should be forced to take advantage of the liquidity premium when you're young. And that's when you should be taking the risk. But most young people, because they don't think about this, they don't study it. It's not their primary um, you know, thing that makes them their money. It's not their, their career. They, they under invest in those years where everything's working in your favor in terms of compounding. So, uh, 93 to 98, you're at Notre Dame, you develop the, this endowment model, and then uh, this is after you've had the call to go to your your uh, your alma mater, and I can see yeah. you've got the Fighting Irish uh, poster just over yeah, your shoulder the idea, there. Yeah. Then uh, University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill calls, and what do they say? Well, it, it's actually funny. So, you know, I was the number two guy at Notre Dame. I was always going to be the number two guy. You know, Scott's a year older than me. We lived in the same dorm, had the same major. Uh, he's never going to leave. And um, so, but I was happy being number two. I was at the alma mater, but the wife was a little less happy. Turns out, you know, North Carolina is a little nicer place than South Bend. So North Carolina calls and says, hey, we're interested in, in you being the CIO. And I said, hey, hon, there's a job in North Carolina. She says, take it. I said, don't you want to know what it is? Said, no, I just want to live in North Carolina. And uh, she was right. So 21 years ago, we, we came down here and and we've loved it. I mean, it's it's just amazing. And the best part about it actually was Notre Dame, I mean, I'm sorry, UNC was so broken when I got here that it was just easy to look good. Like if you're going to go someplace, it's better to go someplace that's not perfect because then you can look really smart. And I use the basketball analogy. That's the deep value stuff. guy in you. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Again, deep value. Um, you know, my first year, everything we did, we look, you know, tomahawk slam dunk. Second year free throws. <laughs> third year, uh, I mean, uh, second year uh, layups. Third year free throws. Fourth year had to take a jump shot. It wasn't even until year five we had to do anything hard and take a three pointer. And and again, it was because they didn't have a discipline. They didn't have an investment policy. They were run by a part time board. They didn't have staff. They didn't think strategically. They didn't have a value bias. They didn't take advantage of the liquidity premium. So all the things that I had 
inculcated from my time at Notre Dame and working with Cambridge and being fortunate enough to have Jack Meyer as a mentor from Harvard. You know, I've been very lucky. You know, it's interesting. I've been incredibly blessed in my life to have just unbelievable mentors. And it's not like they spent an hour a week talking to me, but they spent some time helping me. And I also paid attention to what they did. So I watched what they did and I learned from them and, and I had an open mic to them. Again, I didn't abuse it, but uh, so Jack Meyer was, was a great mentor. Julian Robertson, when I got to UNC, was a fantastic mentor. I mean, I just wow. I, there, there, aren't, there aren't words to describe how great that was. And it, again, it's not a lot of time. It's just there's a lot of value in what little time you can get. And so the best advice I, I always give young people is, is ask. Because people want to be mentors. And, oh, that person is too busy. Oh, that, just ask. Because they could say no, but they might say yes. So uh, that mentorship was really important in helping, again, hone and develop the value bias. So, again, I come to North Carolina, uh, really easy to, to look good because it was broken. But you also had this guy, Julian, who I was able to dive deeply into building a relationship and, and maybe one of the greatest value investors ever. And that's that's not an over exaggeration. Look, I'm prone to hyperbole, as most people know, um, but that's not hyperbolic. I mean, the guy is is one of the truly great value investors of our age. And the, and the other thing that, that he, I think, is on there. There are no peers of him is in the identification, training and backing of talent. I mean, if you look at the people that have worked for him over the years and now manage money, most of it with a value bias, not all of it, but most of it, um, they're some of the greatest managers ever in the business. Th these are the tiger cubs that you're referring yes. to cause from, from uh, Julian's tiger th through to all of the tiger cubs. Um, without disclosing any confidences, what, what, are they, what, what did Julian teach you? What did you, what did you learn? What is uh, yeah, so, I mean, Julian's the best. I mean, so... One of the things that is really important is is don't fudge the numbers, right? So he'd come up and he'd ask somebody, so you know, tell me about this, and and he would immediately tell when the person was bullshit. The exact answer, and he's like, hey, stop, never fudge the numbers. Just say, Julian, I don't have the number. I'll get I'll get it, and I'll come back to you. So you know, don't extrapolate, don't interpolate, only evaluate the real data. And um, there's a great line from Seth Klarman about the same thing. He, he said uh, one day at a meeting uh, to a group of, of analysts, he said, so what do we know uh, about this company? And this one analyst says, well, I think, he says, stop. I didn't ask you what you think. I don't care what you think. Don't ever think. I want to know what we know, what is factual. I don't want your interpretation. I want facts. And that's really important. So don't fudge the numbers, one of the really important things. Second is um, never double down, always double up. And here's the interesting thing. So most people think, you know, if you've done the work and, and you buy something and it goes against you, you should buy more. And what Julian would say is, no, you know, we're just wrong, right? We made a mistake and, you know, the market's right. The market's, <laughs> and this goes back to the efficient markets. It's not that the market's always efficient, but when it's telling you you're wrong, you should listen to it. And you know, there's the famous picture of Paul Tudor Jones in his dorm room with the losers average loser right. sign. And uh, it's interesting. So I've had this um, gift. It's a, really a gift that I've been able to interview uh, pretty much every person that worked for Julian that's formed uh, their own fund. And I have these notebooks. I probably turn into a book someday. But yeah. <laughs> I have these notebooks of, of notes from all these guys saying, you know, what did you learn working for Julian? What did you learn working at Tiger? What did you learn, you know, in separating and leaving and, and starting your own firm? And, you know, without fail, you know, they all have different things like, you know, what made Julian great? Well, he was super competitive, right? One of the most competitive person they've ever met. You know, someone else is, oh, just he's the most honest person in the world, right? You, dishonesty is just not allowed, right? And this is a guy who went through customs once with a pair of shoes on that he forgot to declare and he sent a check the next day. <laughs> Most people lie, right? Forget sending a check. Um, so, but every single person I ever interviewed said he had an uncanny ability to double up. Now, most people would say, well, wait a minute, that's, that's not a value investor. Well, think about it. 
is it or is it not? So what he's saying is when he had edge, when he had you know knowledge about an area, an asset, a, a company, and they made an investment, and now the market is coming around to your view, rather than do what most human beings do, which is pull their flowers, right? They're so happy to have a win, they take profits. He's like, well, let's buy more, because it's working. And you know, there's the simple statement of let's do more of what's working and less of what's not. Um, most of us don't do that, right? We do more of what's not working and less of what's working, um, which is why the average person underperforms. Right. Um, but he had that a bit. So I, I'm still not good at it. I, because I have such a deep value bias in me that when things start to get frothy, I just don't have the ability to double up. Um, a great example would be uh, in, the, in real time, uh, AMD, right? I had great insight because of our uh, move into to blockchain and crypto a couple of years ago um, that, that you know, AMD was one of the companies uh, making GPUs. Um, it was clearly a deep, deep value when it got down to single digits. And so I bought it and great. So it goes up and then it gets to 30 bucks this year. And I'm like, okay, it's just way overvalued. The you know, price to book's crazy and I just can't take it anymore. And, and I sold. Well, now it's to 45. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, it's probably a short here, but that's not the point. The point is that I didn't have the guts to, to double up the same way that, that, you know, he would now that's unique. And there are, you know, there are only one or two of him in the world. So that's probably why they're, they're really good at it. Let me, let me take you back a little bit. Uh, so you start at, uh, UNC Chapel Hill, 1998, you have this value bias, but you're going into uh, a really tough time for value investors. So how did you manage through that period? No, oh, okay. such a great question. I love talking about this period because you're right. When I got there, um, everything that I believed in my core was going against me, right? Everything, because this was the the mid cycle adjust or mid cycle rebound from '95, and you know things were starting to get really frothy. And then you know I get there, and Fed, which they were you know, worried about Y2K pumped half a trillion, back when half a trillion was, was a lot of money, uh, half a trillion dollars into the economy to try to combat Y2K. And, and we had this you know, year-long explosion from kind of you know, October 98 to October 99. And basically everything that I believed in from a value investor perspective was just out the window. Now, I, I will give myself a little bit of credit because I, I was willing to let some winners run and we had allocated money to Nicholas Applegate, great growth firm, uh, to a firm called Oxley in Boston, great international growth firm, and they were crushing it. I mean, the fourth quarter of 99, our portfolio, our domestic equity portfolio was up 40%, 4-0. That's in a good quarter. quarter. <laughs> Three months, right? And we got way out of whack with our investment policy. So February board meeting, and uh, I go into the board and I say, all right, guys, we need to rebalance, right? You know, things are, are looking really pricey. This was kind of right before the March, you know, super peak. And I'm starting to feel a little nervous. And, and we had made a ton of money in venture capital. I mean, a ton of money. And uh, starting to get distributions. And I'll tell you about one in a little bit. But uh, I said, we got to rebalance. And my board chair says, Mark, you're, you're out of your mind. These are our best managers. You, we, we're not going to take money from them. I said, but our policy says we have to go from 37 back to 30 because we're, we're overweight. And he says, well, we're the board. And you're the one that made up this policy. In fact, we don't like the word policy. We want you to change that word to guideline. I'm like, <laughs> come on. He's like, no, I'm serious. So they made me change it to guideline. I couldn't sell anything. So the market starts to roll over in March. I come back in May. And they're like, okay, fine. You can go to the top end of the range, but... Uh, these are our best managers, no more. By September, they're like, get this shit out of here. And oh, by the way, change that word back to policy. And so that, back to disciplined investment advisors, that discipline of overriding the emotion of, hey, these are our best managers. Hey, this is, you know, trees are going to grow to the sky. And where I, where I really got my conviction on why we needed to get hedged 
and why we transitioned from basically long only at the end of 99 to 60, 60 percent in hedge funds by 2002, which I'll talk about in a second, um, was because of this one incident with a, a distribution. So we had made an investment in this uh, venture capital fund in Boston. They invested in a bunch of companies, but one of the companies they did was Art Technology Group. Art Technology was literally the company, consulting company, that helped companies change their name to .com. And as soon as you change your name to .com, it went up a lot. So this stock went public, went up 200x. So wow. our cost, our cost was 50 cents. Stock was trading at 100, and we wow. get distributed shares after the lockup. And uh, I, I call the guy, the board chair. I mean, the the chair of the venture capital fund, and said, "What should I do?" He says, "Well, Mark, I'm an insider, so I can't really talk, but I can say two things." revenues, six million, market cap, six billion. <laughs> and I was silent for a second. He said, Mark, you still there? I'm like, um, yeah, I, I got to go. I, I got to go. <laughs> sell, sell, sell. And somebody sell this. And here's the crazy thing. The stock went to four. It went down 96%. At four, it still would have been an eight bag. It's still a great return. It's a venture capital investment, right? But we got out at 100. So we made 200 times our money, which I haven't done very many times in my life. Um, it wasn't a lot. You only need a couple of those. Yeah, we turned a hundred thousand into twenty million for the university, so that was good. But it made me realize how quickly we need to change. So I go to the that September board meeting and say, you know, we need to put a bunch of money in hedge funds. And the chancellor says, well, that's going to be a problem. I said, well, why is that? He says, well, we banned hedge funds a few years ago. I said, what do you mean you banned them? Well, there's this nasty article about Julian in Business Week, and. Um, they banned hedge funds. I said, all right, fine. We'll have no hedge funds. We'll have long short equity, opportunistic equity, absolute return, and enhanced fixed income. And he said, that's just nomenclature, right? And I said, yep. He says, good, as long as we're clear. <laughs> so we did put 60% of the fund in hedge funds, and that was to get protective. And uh, so from 2000 to 2002, market fell 53%, peaked to trough. And uh, remember, that was when we had the Greenspan put. So the market couldn't go down. Had no sells, 100% buy ratings. No one thought you could ever lose money. If you held those four stocks for the last 20 years, your return is negative. Microsoft's wow. done well. The other three, have, uh, three are still down. So, and Howard Marks has a great line about this. Um, you know, one of the great value investors of all time. Uh, he has a great line. He says, there's no investment good enough that you can't screw up by paying too much, <laughs> right? And he has, and the inver inverse is true, right? There's no investment bad enough that you can't fix with a low price, right? There is a price for everything. Right. And so, um, you know, we got hedged. We were able to be flat from 2000 to 2002, which, again, I always say, I'm not going to break my arm, pat myself on the back for not making money, but we didn't lose any money. And, you know, one of my favorite, again, value guys, Roy Newberger, founder of the Newberger and Berman, you know, he went in the office every day to his 94. It's one of my goals. And uh, managed his own money. to was 101, second goal. <laughs> and he finally passed it at 105. So uh, pretty good life. And um, he said there are only three rules to managing money. Rule number one, don't lose money. Rule number two, don't lose money. Rule number three, don't forget the first two rules. <laughs> so as a value-biased person, um, I've, I've at least come to appreciate my blind spot on growth and, and momentum, and I'm still pretty bad at it, but I'm not as bad as I used to be. But I, I really do still think that you make the most money if you allocate to areas when they're really, really cheap. And so let me, let me give you one story from 98 when I first started, because I think it's applicable right now in real time. So in 1998, you know, I get to North Carolina, right? We have no investment policy. We basically have stocks and bonds. We have no hedge funds, no private, no real estate, no energy. And I have this rule. If I hear it once, I remember it. If I hear it twice, I write it down. If I hear it three times, I do something about it. I love that. And so I saw this cover on The Economist saying that the world was awash in oil. There was this cover, the Roughnecks covered in oil. And in the article, it said oil was 11. It was going to five. And someday oil would be free. <laughs> that just doesn't sound right. It sounds like it costs money to get it out of the ground. So free sounds like the wrong price, but okay, fine. Um, but I remembered it. Two weeks later, 
I saw Richard Rainwater on the cover of Business Week, and it said he was naked long, $900 million of oil futures. I'm like, ding, 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 tore that out, put it on my desk, wrote it down. Two weeks after that, three guys trained by Richard came into my office in Chapel Hill and said, hey, uh, we're raising natural gas partners uh, to go invest in energy. And, uh, you know, don't you want to invest? And I said, yes. So got to do something about it. Go to the board meeting, say, all right, I want to invest with these guys. I want to put 1% with NGP. I want to put 5% in energy. My board chair says, Mark, that's the dumbest. <laughs> it's going ever. to zero. Right? And, uh, but if you really want to do it, okay. And uh, I'm like, okay, great, great. And he calls me in his, the chancellor's office after and says, Mark, when I say it's the dumbest idea I ever heard, that's what I meant. The other stuff was just to be nice. <laughs> so chancellor has this great line. He says, well, Max, you know, if, if we're not going to take his ideas, we should just fire him right now. But, you know, he's only been here a couple months, so we should probably try a couple ideas. And then if they don't work, we can fire him. I'm like, I'm saying it right here. <laughs> so they didn't fire me. They let me do the 5%. That 5% generated 25% of the endowments returns the next 10 years. Wow. Not because I'm a genius. I'm not a genius. It's because Richard Rainwater's a genius. Natural Gas Partners guys are geniuses. Boone Pickens was a genius. All these guys were buying what was on sale. And so I feel like we're there in energy again, right? Nobody wants I to agree. be in the energy. is 4% of the S&P. I was just at an annual meeting yesterday, no, two days ago. And uh, the firm does financial services and energy. It's so bad that their LPs are forcing them to divide the fund into two funds. And I went to the energy breakout, and I'm not exaggerating. Okay, there are 200 people at this meeting for the general meeting. In the energy breakout, other than people that work at the firm and their portfolio company CEOs, there were five people. Five. So... I think this is that time where you got to buy what's on sale. You got to do what's hard, right? Which is in life, if you do what's hard, it's better than do what's easy. And um, you got to step up and, and really look. Now, it's dangerous because there are a bunch of companies that literally are going to go to zero because they have too much debt. Um, but there's a bunch of really good companies with really good assets. And, you know, despite what Elon after cars next year, and there are not going to be a million robo-taxis uh, driving around next year. And um, oil and gas is going to be a big part of our economy globally for the next 100 years or so. Um, so, Yeah, I, I, could, feel... I, I couldn't agree with you more there. Yeah. Uh, there's a, there's one, two things that I just want to ask you, how, how you resolve the conflict between, on one hand, rebalancing yeah. and getting back to, to, to where you need to be uh, according to your guidelines or your policy, and then Julian's uh, double up when you uh, have something moving together. So how do you resolve that tension between those two? Look, that's, that's the genius of Julian, right? I mean, I, I, think, I think in everything we do, whether it be when is the right time to uh, buy a cheap asset, when to catch the falling knife, uh, versus when is the time to sell an overappreciated asset, Look, I'm on record, right? And everybody likes to tease me on Twitter about it. You know, I'm on record saying, you know, a year ago in October that I thought the market would fall 40, 40 percent. And you know, everybody's, oh, but it's up 24 percent this year. I'm like, yeah, back up three months, boys and girls. We're up five. We're up five, <laughs> not not 25, not 55. We're up five. And if you go back another year to January 2018, now it's almost two years. We're up about seven which is about 3% a year. So that's not really that great. Bonds are actually outperforming, and TLT is outperforming by a lot. Right. But um, it, it is a very big challenge to say, well, was that the right time to want to get hedged? And I had this one guy on Twitter who, who was really busting on me uh, saying, you know, you know you've, been, you've been negative all year, and look how great this year has been. I said, okay, well, but you make the assumption that because I was negative on one asset, that I haven't done anything, right? Or I just got short that one asset. In fact, what I did is I sold the S&P and I bought a diversified basket of six things. I bought some Bitcoin. I bought uh, a proxy for mining, which was AMD. Uh, I bought uh, what we have our fund called the Digital Asset Index Fund, which is a basket of the top 10 cryptos. I bought some TLT. 
and I, I bought uh, our hedged equity fund, and uh, I bought our emerging markets fund. And that basket of six things is actually up 51%, and the S&P is up 25 So I feel pretty good. <laughs> it and, worked up. Yeah. I'm an idiot, right, for not buying the S&P, but I feel less of an idiot because I bought other stuff that I thought had better value. So to specifically answer your question, which is a really, really important question, is how do you balance between that tension, that creative tension, or that, that intellectual tension between rebalancing and, and letting your winners run? Um, I, I think it, it really is, that's the gut feel of investing. And you know, I've read this great book, and I share it with everybody, called The Dow Jones Averages. And Dow is spelled T-A-O. And it's a mix of ancient Chinese philosophy and, and investing. And basically what it talks about is, is most guys, which are most investment people, unfortunately, um, we need more women in the business, but most guys are, tend to be very analytical, very right-handed, very left-brained, very backward-looking, driving with the rearview mirror. And that tends to work in most situations, but it works very, very poorly at inflection points, particularly inflection points at the top, because you drive right off the cliff and, and lose a lot of money, like in 2000 or 2008 or right, like I think now. Um, it also talks about you know most women actually are more uh, left-handed or creative or right-brained. And what you should really be is whole-brained, right? You should use both sides of your brain and, and you should have a little balance. And, and so I think you have to have that whole-brained balance of trusting your intuition, right? That supercomputer in your gut. They say the gut biome is smarter than our brain, has more you know, synapses and all that good stuff. And you know, there's a reason you feel sick to your stomach when you're about to make a great investment. <laughs> Right? And there's a reason you feel euphoric when you're about to make a really bad investment, because your 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 gut is taking all this stimuli, and when you're making a really bad investment decision, which is you know investing at a peak or or selling at the bottom, everyone's telling you how smart you are, right? Because oh, everyone else is doing it, right? And that's why look over the last 20 years, just a crazy stat. If you just bought and held stocks, you made eight. If you bought and held bonds, you made six. If you had a diversified portfolio, you made seven. Average investor made three and a half. Yeah. Oh, that's not what they do. Human beings buy what we wish we would have bought, and we sell what we're about to need. So we come late to the party, and then we sell after it goes down, and then we buy what we wish we would have bought, and we sell after it goes down. And so having the ability to step back and say, okay, I will have a disciplined process of rebalancing, but not to a point. What I do is I have a range around my strategic target. So if my target is 25, I might have a range of 15 to 35. And when you get to 35, you start to rebalance. You maybe don't go all the way back to 25 right away, but you at least get back under the 35. And then if things get really egregious, you go back to 25. And if things get really, really egregious, you might even underweight. And so that comes from pattern recognition and, and uh, but having some discipline process that forces that first step, right? Because it's, it's easier to make the second step, right? If I cut from 37 to 35, going from 35 to 33 or 33 to 32 is a lot easier. If I just let the 37 run and then it goes to 34, I'm like, oh, well, if I just get back to 37, then I'll get out. And then it goes to 31. Right. And now you're losing money as opposed to being in control. And I think that's where the average person gets hurt. I love that. Can I, I want to talk to you about Morgan Creek Digital, but first we need to talk about Morgan Creek itself. So you launched that in 2004. Yep. Uh, what's, the, what's the philosophy at Morgan Creek and how do you express that philosophy? Yeah, so we're a really pretty simple firm. So we're a registered investment advisor and we, we do both advisory as well as a little asset management. And the idea was to bring that endowment model of investing to other investors. Our, our tagline is alternative thinking about investing. You know, people like to talk about alternative investments. I always say alternative to what, right? <laughs> you have stocks, you have bonds, you have currencies, and you have commodities. That's it. There's nothing else. Well, what about hedge funds? Well, you own stocks, you own bonds, you own currencies, you own commodities. No different than if it's in a mutual fund or a private partnership or a separate account. You know, hedge funds is just a legal strategy. Well, what about private equity? I own common stock, preferred stock, or a convertible bond. Okay, what about real estate? I own equity of the deal, the debt of the deal, or the land, the commodity. What about derivatives? 
Well, okay, derivatives derive their value from stocks, bonds, currencies, and commodities. So ultimately, driven by one of those four things. So there are no such thing as alternative investments, right? There's alternative ways of thinking. And to us, that is one, having a value bias, two, embracing the illiquidity premium, three, having discipline, four, making sure that you do the work to get access to the best and brightest and follow the talent, because the talent will always lead you to the best investment opportunities. And you know, I, I have no pride of authorship. I'll, I'll copy from the best of them. You know, Picasso said, good artists borrow, great artists steal. But I will steal from the best of them. And you know, I, I say I have the best job in the world. I get paid to travel around the world and talk to the smartest people in the world about investing. How awesome is that? <laughs> it sounds I mean, pretty good. It's just awesome. And actually, Twitter makes it even easier. I mean, good example. So I, I spoke to um, a big bank, uh, had their annual meeting in Greece, and they had 300 of their clients, and they invited me to come over, and Niall Ferguson was there, and you know, a couple others. And uh, you know, someone saw that I, I, took, I, had, I actually got there through a, a crazy flight. I landed at 4 in the morning. I took a selfie of myself with the clock saying 4 a.m. and no one else in the airport. And three different people in Athens saw that tweet and said, hey, you're in town, let's get together. And so I got to spend you know, three hours with some amazing investors uh, that you know, gave me really, really interesting insights on what's going on in Greece. And most people don't know Greece is the fastest growing economy in the EU today. I didn't know that. It. And uh, the only thing better than that was uh, four years ago, right when um, the Greek crisis was at its crescendo, I was actually on vacation and I tweeted a picture that I was in Athens and a guy said, hey, you're in town? You want to meet the president of the biggest bank in Greece? I'm like, uh, yes, I'll hit that bid. And within two hours, I was in the bank office president, bank president's office, and it was me, himself, two armed guards, and that was it. And after an hour and a half, I said, you know, I, I got to go. Uh, the boat's leaving for the cruise, because he would talk to me all day because he had nothing else to do because the banks were closed. But my favorite part of the story is I had this crazy idea that, you know, I say, you know, startup companies. Uh, in industries where, where there's lots of liability is pretty cool. It's like a startup um, insurance company or a startup tobacco company would be really cool. But a startup bank in Greece, I thought would be pretty cool because you have no NPLs. And I thought he'd poop. Great idea. In fact, I know where we could get a license and we'd only need about $10 million in capital. I said, did, did you just say we? Like, like you and me, it's like, oh, hell yeah. You know, I only make $300,000 because, you know, we're 60% owned by the government. I'd love to work for a private company. Let's do it. So my wife wasn't into that one, so we didn't move to Greece. But uh, it probably would have been a good investment. Could have been nice. So tell, tell us about Morgan Creek Digital. Yep. Where did so, the idea come from Where, and what is it? So to finish the thought on Morgan Creek, so we start off advising families, institutions, and then we created fund of funds businesses, manager managers businesses. Then we started doing co-investments. Then we started doing direct investments in special purpose vehicles. And today, the bulk of our business is private investments around fund of funds, co-investments, and these special purpose vehicles. Like the latest one is, you know, we're doing a special purpose vehicle for DraftKings. I mean, so we do individual deals. And then... Uh, Six years ago, I'll go all the way back to go forward. So six years ago, uh, Dan Moorhead, guy who spun out of Tiger, we were his first institutional money. I've known Dan for 25 years. He worked for Julian. He decided to start a fund 14 years ago. We backed him. Six years ago, out in California, he says, I'm shutting down the fund, giving back a billion dollars. I'm going to start two funds, one in Bitcoin, one in crypto infrastructure. And I say I was not dealing drugs on Silk Road. I was not a cryptography student, so I didn't really understand Bitcoin back then. But I did understand picks and shovels. And if you're going to do infrastructure of a new asset class, I want to be there. So we put a little money in Dan's fund. It's up 10x. That's great. First of my many bad decisions, I should have gone the Bitcoin fund. That's up 140 times. Wow. Didn't do that. So fast forward a couple of years, I write about Bitcoin, a special situation. Clients say, we'll fire you if you don't stop talking about magic internet money. <laughs> Go back to talking about real stuff. Like that's a really, really radical reaction, but okay. In fact, the next paragraph was about Saudi equities. They had no problem with that, but they had a problem with Bitcoin. Bitcoin has been a way better investment than Saudi equities over the last five years. So fast forward another couple of years, we're investing in a special purpose vehicle for Lyft. We did a lot of ride sharing. We did Uber. We did Lyft. We did Didi. We did Quadi. We did uh, Grab. We did Ola. So we did a lot. And we're in Lyft. And 
Pomp and Jason uh, Williams, Anthony Pompliano and Jason Williams, run full tilt. So we co-invested together in, in Lyft. We met for 20 minutes. I didn't think anything of it. Then, actually, podcast. I love podcasts. I heard uh, Pomp on uh, Patrick O'Shaughnessy's podcast. I'm like, huh, sounds pretty smart for a young guy. I should, I should, I should meet him. So I met him for breakfast. Hour turns into three hours. Three hours turns into six hours. Then we meet the next day. And within a week, we're like, we got to work together. So we set up two years ago a subsidiary of Morgan Creek Capital called Morgan Creek Digital Assets. And then we launched a fund a year ago to invest in infrastructure around blockchain technology and crypto. And uh, we invested that, raised $40 million, invested that. Now we just did our first close for our second fund, out raising about $250 million and did a close on $60 million here recently. Congrats. Thanks. And so you, the one of the uh, more visible parts of Morgan Creek Digital is the index. Yes. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about the index? Yeah. So, you know, we we went down the picks and shovels route and said, look, if if you think about institutions, the great wall of money, as I like to call it, um, they're not going to go speculate in crypto right away. What they're going to do is they're going to want to own picks and shovels and infrastructure just like you know, back in the internet, you know, you invested in Yahoo and Google and you didn't necessarily speculate on, on little internet companies, um, but you want to do the infrastructure. And I think the same thing can be true here. So we raised a venture capital fund to invest in, in infrastructure. But while we were out on the road um, talking to people, they said, well, yeah, but I might want to put a little bit in, you know, crypto itself, particularly Bitcoin. You, know, you guys talk about how Bitcoin is one of the most important computer networks in the world. The only way you can own it is through the protocol. You know, it's, it's like Amazon's a network, Facebook is a network. If you want to own those networks, you own the corporate entity. Bitcoin is a network. The only way to own it is to actually own the protocol itself. And that's the difference between the internet age, all the value went to the application developers, not the protocol developers. Tim Berners-Lee invented the internet, not a rich guy. Got a knife. Um, and yeah, got a knighthood. That's that's true. I, 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 he's amazing. He's amazing. And he's working on something in, in uh, crypto that might make him a really rich guy. So, uh, but, you know, amazing, amazing guy. 30 years ago, wrote the first web page. Now we have 1.7 billion globally. Um, so it's a big deal. But, you know, Krugman said it would never be more important than the fact. The thing, maybe. Okay. So here we are at uh, blockchain technology and a couple big institution said, you know, if you guys had an index fund where we didn't have to really think about it, um, we might be interested. So we went out and one of our investments was with a firm called Bitwise, an uh, asset management firm. And we said, hey, could we co-brand uh, index fund? So what we want it to be, and it's a very arrogant, I know, but you know, we've got to shoot high to, to maybe do well, is that we want to be the S&P 500 of crypto. Well, what does that mean? It doesn't mean we want to be the S&P 500. It means we want to do what they do. So what did they do? They said, all right, we're going to have an index. And there are a lot of indexes, thousands and thousands of indexes. In fact, there are more indices than stocks. But there's only one S&P 500. Why? Because they said, we want to have 85% of the market cap of the industry. We only want to include liquid names so they don't allow closely held companies. Like Tesla should be in based on size, but it's not because it's too much owned by Elon. And then we as a committee are gonna decide what companies represent American enterprise. So they kick out GE and they put in Twitter. Interesting move, right? That's been pretty accretive actually, but when they kicked out Woolworth and put in Yahoo, that one didn't work out so well. So they're not perfect, but the committee runs it. So we set up the same process. We have a committee. We, we pick the top 10 crypto that are liquid. So we have the top 10 excluding XRP and, and uh, Stellar because they're too closely held by the foundation and those people are really mad at us, but it's nothing against them. It's just, we have to have a process. And uh, so that digital asset index fund is, is a pretty cool thing because it lets people just have passive exposure to the market cap of the industry as it grows. You can get it as a credit investor, small investment minimum. Um, and we start to see some people get, get interested in it. Interested in it. Well, that's fantastic. Look, I want to be sensitive to your time. Uh, so I could talk all afternoon. I love, <laughs> I love talking about value. I love talking uh, about uh, the things you want to talk about because you, you've done, one, you've done great prep. Two, you got lots of interesting topics that you want to dive into. So uh, 
I, I could probably talk for too long, but then people get bored <laughs> and they turn us off. Well, I really do appreciate the time, Mark. If folks want to get in contact with you, uh, yep. you're a great Twitter follow. Uh, what's your Twitter handle? So I'm just at Mark Yusko, M-A-R-K-Y-U-S-K-O. And uh, we have a website, uh, morgancreekcapcap.com. And uh, there's, there's lots of resources out there. We actually have a, a pretty cool YouTube channel. It's called Around the World with Yusko. So if you just type my name into YouTube, it'll come up. And what we do there is once a month, we do something called Around the World with Yusko. And it's, it's called Around the World with Yusko, not because I'm an egomaniac, but we had a marketing guy. We used to do a lot with Merrill Lynch, and there was this marketing guy, and and uh, we wanted to originally call it, you know, the Morgan Creek Capital Update. And he said, no, no one wants to talk to Morgan Creek Capital. They want to talk right. to a human being. So he said, we're going to call it Around the World with Yusko, and it's going to be like a call-in radio show. And it was awesome. We did it for about six or seven years, and uh, it turns out people do want to talk to human beings. So we do a similar thing. It's not a call-in show, but it's a once-a-month webinar and we do lots of different topics. You know, recently we did crypto, but we've done China, we've done oil, we've done, you know, value investing, you know, we've done all kinds of stuff. And those presentations uh, are up on the YouTube channel if people want to get to them. That sounds great. I'll check that out. And uh, Morgan Creek Digital for the index, where do folks go? Yes. Yeah, so then if you come to Morgan Creek Cap, uh, two things will pop up. One will be all of our resources, and then the other will be a landing page for the Digital Asset Index Fund, and that takes you to Bitwise uh, out in San Francisco to uh, to buy the fund directly. Uh, and that's pretty cool because you can do it literally directly online. It, it's really quick. Uh, you know, we're we're not quite where we should be, which is literally, you know, through facial recognition and blockchain identification. Uh, we don't have to submit utility bills and all that other crap. But uh, we'll get there eventually, and, and hopefully we'll invest in some of the companies that make that happen. It's absolutely fascinating. Mark Yusko, thank you very much. Thanks, Toby. I'd love to uh, be with you this afternoon. And uh, again, love the show and, and love to talk value with people who understand hashtag the value of value. <laughs> That's very kind. Thank you. <laughs> 